Okay, welcome. So today I want to be talking a little bit about Prince Harry's book, the second part today of um, his book Spare. Today I'm going to be looking at more Eton, his time at Eton, his relationship with Prince Harry. Also going to talk a little bit about dissociation um, and I'll touch a little bit on being labelled the naughty one. So enjoy. So yeah, I've been reading this book and this Saturday Gabor Mate is going to be interviewing Prince Harry and I'm going to be um, attending that event. I'll, I'll put a link in the bottom. It's £20 to attend. Basically, it's the price of the book. Um, and you can buy Gabor Mate's book as well. And, you know, on that you can ask questions. So I've asked him a question about his boarding school experiences. So today I wanted to just touch on a little bit about uh, his time at Eton. So he goes to Eton in the uh, summer, the autumn of page 41. So page 41 in the book, he says, in the early autumn of 1998, having completed my education at Ludgrove, and I talk about that in the previous video, um, I entered Eton, a profound shock. The finest school in the world for boys, Eton was meant to be a shock, I think. Shock must have been part of its original charter, even perhaps a part of the instructions given to its first architects by the school's founder, my ancestor, Henry VIII. Henry VI, sorry. He deemed Eton some sort of holy shrine, a sacred temple, and to that end he wanted it to overwhelm the senses so visitors would feel like meek, abased pilgrims. So he goes to Eton and what I get again, and I mentioned this a bit, uh, you know, because his mother died when he was 12. So he goes to Eton. So it feels that, you know, it's like a huge shock. And he's saying it's like a real shock going there. Um, he's talking about, you know, once he gets there, that William, his brother, is like, I don't know you and I've, I've mentioned this before in some of my other videos of um, you know that the William just says I, I don't want to know you um, and so many people have come to me since then and they've gone yeah that was exactly the same with my brother my you know my brother said don't speak to me so it's a very common thing in boarding school so what he says um, Willie told me to pretend I didn't know him on page 42. What? You don't know me, Harold, and I don't know you. For the last two years, he explained, Eton had been his sanctuary. No kid brother tagging along, pestering him with questions, pushing up on his social circle. He was forging his own life, and he wasn't willing to give that up. None of us, none of which was all that new, Willie always hated it when anyone made the mistake of thinking us a package deal. He loathed it when Mummy dressed us in the same outfits. It didn't help that her taste in children's clothes ran to the extreme. We often looked like twins from the twins from Alice in Wonderland land. I barely took notice. I didn't care about clothes, mine or anyone else's. So if we can just, if I unpick this a bit, so as I shared in the last video, you know, his mother's died. His father's not really emotionally there, as, he, as I shared last week. He can't um, give emotionally, so he feels kind of abandoned. And then he goes to this new school and suddenly his brother's like, I just don't want to know you. So, you know, and I want to talk a little bit about that. And it's very common... In, in boarding school syndrome in the work of Joy Chavrin and Nick Duffel is that Joy Chavrin talks about the A, B, C, D of boarding school syndrome. First one is abandonment. Second one is bereavement. Homesickness, bereavement. We called it homesickness at school, but it's actually bereavement. And C's captivity. And, you know, here he's basically been abandoned. Um, and, you know, this is very common for us. You know, it's not just that we've been left at school. We can't see our parents, but we can't see, you know, um, 
our friends, you know, he talks about that, that his best friend from uh, his first school, Ludgrove, Henners, has gone to another school. So he's like, suddenly he's alone. And he talks about that in the book here, that the first day he's there in the room uh, at Manor House. And he says, worse without my best friend, Henners, he was attending a different school. I didn't even know how to get dressed in the morning. Every Etonian was required to wear a black tailcoat, white collarless shirt, white stiff collar pinned to the shirt with a stud. And he goes on, he says, First morning, it took forever to fasten my trousers, button my waistcoat, fold my stiff collar, before finally getting out the door. I was frantic, desperate not to be late. And he says about Manor House, he says many of the 60 boys in Manor House were as welcoming as Willie. Their indifference, however, didn't unsettle me as much as their ease. So this is another thing about boarding school that I found is that because we don't talk up, we get this sense that everyone's sorted out, everyone's, you know, they don't struggle with their anger, they don't struggle with their tears. And therefore we think, and he says here, you know, their indifference, however, didn't unsettle me as much as their ease. Even the ones my age act as if they'd been born on the school grounds. So we build up this persona that, ah, oh, everything's good, you know, I'm sorted. But, you know, and I felt that at school. I'm like, oh, you know, they can handle it, so I have to handle it. But the, we never talked, so we never asked them how they were. And I've often heard this in my work with clients, exporters, is, yeah, you know, I thought they were all sorted. But the reality is, is none of us were. It's just this facade, this, you know, this um, carapace, this shield that we put up. So, you know, those are some of the ideas there. Um, so that was about his brother. Um, he goes on to say, you know, page 42 again, he says, it's heaven for brilliant boys, Eton. It could only, it could thus only be purgatory for one very unbrilliant boy. So he's basically saying he arrives, first French class, they're just speaking fluent French. And, you know, again, he's like, whoa, what have I arrived into? You know, I'm not that brilliant boy. So he asked if he put down a, a set. Um... Yeah, I wanted to also talk a little bit here about dissociation. So he talks about that quite a bit in the book. Um, he talks about it, you know, page 68, um, page 66. He says, talking about his mum again, the illusion of mummy hiding, because he talks about that, that, he believes he believed as a child that she um, she hadn't really died she'd hidden somewhere and you know so he's like the illusion of mummy hiding preparing to return was never so real that it could not could blot out reality entirely but it blotted it out enough that I was able to expose to postpone the bulk of my grief I still hadn't mourned still hadn't cried except that one time at her grave still hadn't processed the bare facts. Part of my brain knew, but part of it was wholly insulated, and the division between those two parts kept the parliament of my consciousness divided, polarised, gridlocked, just as I wanted it. And this is a key symptom of boarding school syndrome and trauma. You know, so in Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, the psychiatrist, he says here, Dissociation is the essence of trauma. The overwhelming experience is split off, what Harry's just said there, split off and fragmented so that the emotion, sounds, images, thoughts and physical sensations related to the trauma take on a life of their own. The sensory fragments of memory intrude into the present where they are literally relived. Yeah, so that is uh, Bessel van der Kolk. And then in here, Joy Shaverin, again, she talks about the ABCD of boarding school syndrome. The D is dissociation. So what happens is that we start to dissociate. So for me, when I arrived at school, uh, I think I cried. Well, I know I cried once 
the whole dormitory came in, laughed at me, and it was like, I'm never doing that again. I started to split those parts. The way I did that was I really I beat myself up. Now, Harry goes on to talk about this um, in page 68, he, 69. He talks about Club H. So when he gets home to Highgrove House, uh, to Highgrove, they hide in this Club H, which is an underground bunker, which Harry and uh, Prince William, they make into a bit of a den. So there's a, a secret entrance and they have basically parties down there. And he says, when it was just the two of us down there, we'd play games, games, listen to music, talk. Um, with Bob Marley, Fat Boy Slim, DJ Sakin, or Yamanda thumping in the background, Willie sometimes tried to talk about mummy. Club H felt like the only place, one place secure enough to broach that taboo subject. Just one problem, I wasn't willing. Whenever he went there, I changed the subject. He'd get frustrated, and I wouldn't, wouldn't acknowledge his frustration. More likely, I couldn't even recognise it. So again, this dissociation learning to split as Bessel van der Kolk talks about. Nick Duffel goes into a little more depth about this dissociation in trauma, abandonment and privilege. Um, and he says here, on the page, page 99, he says there's three levels to a dissociation. First level, he says disowning and repression. I am not the one who is needy, homesick, vulnerable, crying, upset. Second is projection. It's you who's the needy, homesick, vulnerable, despairing one. So maybe what we can see in that scenario with his brother is he's saying, no, no, you're the one. It's not me. We've learned to dissociate. Then the third level, which a lot of wives I hear um, from who are married to ex-boarders, is this idea of projective identification. Partners, spouses, therapists take on and viscerally experience the, the disowned and projected feelings of the ex-border. So we go, it's not me, it's you. And then we create the situation where the other person feels the anxiety, feels um, diminished in some way. So, um, so those are the ideas there. Um... Yeah, I think that's basically what I want to share today. I think, you know, it's a brilliant book. I really love his honesty. And it's lovely to see him talk about this stuff with openness. And I can't believe when I look at online how much hatred he's getting for speaking up. And yet I can understand psychologically why this is happening. Because British society, I see, we have this anything that is weak, anything is vulnerable. We've learnt through dissociation, through so many of our leaders, you know, it's, um, I think it's uh, Robert uh, Vercake in his book, Posh Boys, says 50 out of the top 100 um, journalists, top 100 journalists have been to boarding school, private school, I think, but essentially most of them are boarding school. So it's like that what they've learned at school, they're then, you know, so we live in this culture where, we've dissociated the vulnerable part we've dissociated from ourselves so when we see someone else speak up we attack them which is what i learned at school what you know people would when i cried that time everyone came in and tried to attack me you know i see that in society so it doesn't surprise me that he's getting this stick but actually i feel what a courageous man i mean i just love that he's speaking up um um it's like we need to do that more and more. That's how the healing begins, you know, listening to Nick, Joy. It's like we need to speak. Uh, so I just really honour his courage. Um, if people are interested in me continuing to, uh, to go through the book, um, I will um, do more videos in the future. So I'll put a link in the bottom, you know, do go off and listen to this Bessel van, not Bessel van der Gogh, it's Gabor Mate speaking to Prince Harry. Um, so, I hope you've enjoyed. Any questions, reflections, please do leave them below. Blessings.